Okay. There we go. All right. We're going to do the last, well, sort of the last uh, bit of shafts today. We're actually skipping chapter 7 6, the critical frequency section. Um, we'll come back to that when we do critical frequencies for multiple things. We'll just put them all together. Um, so we're going to skip 7 6 and go to 7 7 and 7 8, which are shaft components and um, limits and fits, or at least an introduction to limits and fits, that sort of thing. Uh, let's see. So let's. I made some parts, printed some parts, so that we can oh, get an idea of what these things do and what they look like, what they mean. Uh, let's see, here's most of the parts. These are kind of hard to see. I might need to put them not on the. There we go. There we go. <clears throat> so, in your book, it starts, what does it start with? So this is again, 10th edition of Shigley. Um, so miscellaneous shaft components on page 380. So it starts with the set screws. I printed out, these are just 3D printed. Again, I just grabbed the models from McMaster and printed them uh, for these set screws. I printed two different types. Um, so the, wow, that's really blown out. I wonder if we can tone that down some so you might have a chance at seeing there we go maybe the high, maybe i shouldn't have printed them in white it's kind of bright um these have little socket heads on them so that you could get tool and then they're threaded and they have different points on the end so this one has a, a cup point it's not going to be really easy to see what's going on there um, i'll show you the picture in the book in a minute um, this one, same idea, but it has a flat point. Um, there's some that have pointed points. Uh, there's rounded points. Kind of move these out of the way. Here's a assortment. Sometimes, uh, like on this one, the the tip here might be flat, like they show it here. Um, it also might be like a nylon, a rubbery one. So they have some non-marring ones also that. Uh, are, they kind of look like this, but they have a rubberish nylon tip on them so that they don't scratch up whatever it is you're tightening them against. The point of these things is to be able to uh, help whatever your element is, so a gear or a pulley or just a hub or whatever, help it stay in sync with the shaft. So, um, for instance, I printed this little shaft piece here. Um, and I did print, a, it's got a lot of different, it's got a slot here and a slot here. Um, you wouldn't normally have all of these on one piece. I just only wanted to print one that had multiple things on it. So it's got one little flat spot. A lot of times you'll have a flat spot where these are going to sit. You know, otherwise they're going to sit on a round spot, which won't give them as much contact area. So a lot of times there'll be a flat milled in to the... Uh, shaft that it's going on. So the idea is you've got your gear or whatever it is and then you would put this in. By the way, I 3D printed all this stuff um, and you'll notice the I did scale it up really large. Well, I didn't scale it up. This is an actual size. Again, it came from McMaster. Um, it's not a common size. It's pretty large. It's a M12, I think. Um, 1.75 on the pitch or the thread spacing. So you would screw it in, maybe have to tighten it down. And now that, I don't know if you'll be able to see down in there, should have made a bigger gap, I guess, but it is sitting against the uh, shaft and it keeps the uh, gear and hub locked with the shaft. So I can't, well, I could, you know, I could like force it around. Um, they do have a limited amount of holding power, which we'll look at in a second, but uh, they, um, the idea is that not only does it keep it from moving axially, which you probably don't want, it keeps it where it can transfer torque from whatever the gear is interfacing with to the shaft or vice versa from the shaft to the gear. Um, and so it can actually transfer torque. Otherwise you get, you know, if it's backed out, you know, you get 
you can spin and actually slide and dislocate from wherever this is supposed to be located. So they, they're serving those two functions. And you have tables like this. This is one table. Um, don't, your book only has the one table in it. Um, it says there for socket set screws, it gives a little asterisk, um, blah, blah, blah. It's telling about the material that it's uh, going to be interfacing with because obviously if this material is really soft, then you can only apply so much what they call seating torque. So that's how, that's how much you're, uh, you know, how much torque you're applying when you tighten it down. That's the seating torque. Um, and then these are for cup point. So cup point would be, actually it's the one that's in here. Um, so it has kind of like this picture up, oh, up here where there's an indention or a little cup inside there. So it's really only making contact around that ring. But, you know, you, you seat it hard enough, then that ring can deform to whatever shape you're going to match over here. So it doesn't have to necessarily have a flat. It can conform a little bit to the, the rounded surface. Um, whereas a flat point one's really made to go against a flattened area here. You might not want this feature in the shaft. You know, this might make the shaft weaker in that location. So you might not want that... Uh, flat or you just might not want the machining process to create that flat or whatever so um, there, there's sometimes different points for uh, what it is that you're going to interface with so how these work now they say holding power and then they give you a pound force so it's a little bit of a misnomer there where power wouldn't be measured in pounds or newtons or anything like that um, but holding power is the you know traditional name for what they're they're talking about here but it's really a force and so how this would work is something like this let's say <clears throat> you've got a shaft we'll pick that one's about actually that one but that's too small let's let's draw it bigger let's draw it this way so here's the in view of a shaft and we're going to have a uh, set screw. There's going to be some kind of hub and a set screw in there pushing on the shaft. So let's, let's just say that the set screw is over here. Again, they're nor not normally this large. <laughs> I'm just having to draw them extra large to, so we can see them. So this will be our set screw. So the book shows us, now it's in US units here. Um, this, not that it particularly matters, but this is a metric set screw. Uh, so let's just pick one of the bigger ones. Let's do a, a quarter inch and seating torque 87 inch pounds. So that's the amount of torque I can apply to it to get it to seat any more than that. And um, I've probably deformed it or maybe the threads have deformed or who knows but um, that's where uh, kind of the limit on how much torque to get it to seat properly um, uh, I guess a little more than that wouldn't be that big a deal I'm sure there's some kind of factor of safety um, but to, to generate this much holding power I need to apply that much seating torque um, so let's say I did quarter inch a thousand pounds so what that means is that uh, there is 1,000 pounds of force that I can apply right here. And so I could go and figure out, well, if I can apply 1,000 pounds to this uh, between the interface between the set screw and the shaft, then that is going to tell me, based on the diameter of the shaft, how much torque that it will hold. So how much torque will it hold before it starts to turn? So it'll hold up to the torque amount would be the force that it can generate between the set screw and the surface of the shaft times this distance. So the radius of the shaft. So if our, I don't know how big that is, let's see. 
that looks close to an inch. Yeah, that's an inch. So the torque that could transmit without slipping would be 1,000 inch pounds. If I tried to apply more than 1,000 inch pounds to maybe this, this gear here, then that's when I would begin to worry that this is going to slip and it's going to, you know, do this. Or maybe it's going to uh, slip on the shaft and run some kind of groove in the shaft. It's not going to do what I intended it for it to do. So um, that's kind of how this works. I don't think they show, maybe they show a calculation on how to do that, but I don't kind of, don't think they do. Yeah, they don't give you an example of that. So that's why I gave you an example of uh, how these set screws work. And you can have more than one. So you can have one here. You can have another one at 90 degrees or maybe 60 degrees. You wouldn't really want them 180 degrees apart. Um, so when you push on this, right, you're, there is a little bit, and we'll talk about the, the slack in here later, but when you push on it, it's going to shove the shaft to one side. So if you ended up with doing this number where your set screws are opposite of each other, now, really the only thing that's holding is the set screws touching the shaft. So if you have them at 90 degrees or at uh, 120 degrees, I guess, then uh, they are creating more, more points of contact. So the shaft is contacting the hub and the set screws, um, but you can have multiples of them if you needed to generate more torque. Maybe I needed more than a thousand inch pounds, so I'd have to apply multiple of these set screws. Just realize when you do that they're, the set screws are going to push the shaft around inside that hub a little bit. Um, and sometimes you have really tight tolerances here and other times it's kind of loose. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so that's set screws. Uh, sometimes they're called grub screws, set screws. Um, I don't, let's see if your book gives any other names for them. No, they, they pretty much call them set screws. Sometimes they talk about socket set screws, but that's just uh, the, a feature on them, not necessarily a particular type. Um, but sometimes you call them grub screws um, or set screws. And they're used to mount a element such as a gear so that it can't move axially. This, this calculation, I guess, could also apply to this way you know it can apply that thousand pounds could also be a thousand pounds in the off the screen in the axial direction so that it it would take a thousand pounds to move it you know axially uh, normally you don't want the elements on a shaft to move axially either um, so they're used to to keep it from moving axially as well as keeping the element from rotating relative to the uh, shaft that it's on because unless it's an axle where you're, you're wanting the, the shaft to stay still and the element to rotate, you normally want these things to rotate together um, because they're transferring some kind of power. The next thing in your book, they go through, well, they actually go through pins and keys. So I didn't create a pin, but uh, the idea for a pin would be um, you'd have a hole, probably a non-threaded hole though, just a hole, um, maybe that hole goes all the way through the other side, but you would drop a pin inside here, you know, inside here through the shaft and maybe even out the other side. These pins come in different flavors, like just a round pin, a dowel, uh, a spring loaded one where it's kind of hollow and springy and you can collapse it down, tapered, um, a lot of different types of pins. Sometimes they're off to the side. Um, they're doing the same kind of thing. They're locating the, the uh, element axially and they're allowing it to transfer torque because in order in order for um, the when the pin is in there then this thing they're going to be synced up unless you shear that pin you know here and here um, and so you could calculate that just like a shear on that pin uh, probably in two places most pins go all the way through uh, I guess you could have a pin that only goes halfway through or so, but normally it goes all the way through. Um, and so there'd be a double shear on that pin. 
Um, the downside to that is that you just drilled a hole all the way through the shaft. So it did make the shaft significantly weaker wherever you drill that hole. But sometimes that hole is, um, you know, far away from any of the torque transfer or anything like that. So maybe it's, it's not a problem. It should have a lower bending moment, um, although it's going to be kind of close to, you know, wherever this gear or pulley is. Uh, so they're, they're usually in situations where you're not so worried about the shaft failing from, uh, you know, you've got plenty of meat on the shaft. You can, you can drill a hole through it and it's not going to be a problem. Um, they don't give you an example of calculating that, but it would just be a double shear on the pin. Maybe I should use a different color pin. So you'd have to shear here, have to shear here and here for it to actually come apart. Um, they do talk about keys also. I did print a key. Here's a key. Um, and that's what this, actually there's two slots here. One, a slot that um, it's not going to be able to tell very easily, but um, it has a, a large fillet at the back end over here. Maybe if I slide this in, you can see what happens. So, uh, you know, it would push the key up if it went further out. That fillet is uh, doing a couple of things. One of the things is um, it does give you a little bit, if you drove this pin in, it does push the pin in and kind of wedge it in there. Uh, that's not necessarily its main point though. The main point is that a lot of times these keyways are near features like this shoulder. Uh, and so that key <clears throat> having a kind of rounded end down there, those are the keyway anyway, not the, not the key, uh, but the key way having a rounded filleted end uh, keeps this from having a sharp corner down inside there. So um, if I had a sharp corner, I don't see my pointer thing. If I had a sharp corner down in here, sharp corner here, those might be really close to each other. Again, I've kind of exaggerated everything and made it really large on these prints, but um, I'm noticing that red is not a great color for it, the compression on it really makes it look bad. Um, so I might need to print them in different colors. But uh, this, this stress concentration near that stress and concentration could be detrimental. You could have them too close together. They could actually interact with each other and create a, a super stress concentration if that's such a thing. Um, so rounding it out reduces the stress concentration here. Um, also, it makes it a little bit easier, to, depending on how you want to cut this, um, it might make it easier or harder, depending on which way you're milling from to create this slot in the first place. Um, I have another one over here that's kind of a circular shape. Um, so these have these are different key slots. So this one is for a rectangular or a square key. This one is for this kind of key. Uh, now this one's uh, half moon-ish. Now normally they're a little bit deeper. I, I kind of made this one little shallow I suppose but this is a Woodruff key um, and they have that fillet on both ends but they also normally let you get uh, a deeper like I could I could cut this a little whoops there it is this a little bit deeper and get more uh, bite into the the shaft again I'd have to cut deeper into the shaft to do that though um, these also have the benefit of if it's deeper here like I didn't make mine all that deep, but a lot of times there'll be almost a half circle. Uh, there won't be quite a half circle, but there'll be close to half a circle here. And um, that prevents them from wanting to roll over. So they, they don't, since they have, they're deeper in there, they don't roll as easy. Like this one, it's not gonna roll, but um, this one, you can get these to roll over and round out the corners and then they're not doing anything anymore, right? Or they're kind of doing thing, uh, but not what you wanted. So the idea is you got a slot in the shaft, a matching slot groove in the uh, element, and then you put them together. Now, there's, they don't do anything typically for axial. Like, see, I can still move axially, but I have torque transfer. Um, you can have these where the key is tapered like a wedge and put them together. I should have printed one. I didn't print one of those and drive it in there. Uh, these are the gib head keys or a tapered key. Um, and you can drive it in there 
and then it prevents some axial as well as it does the torque transfer. The rectangular ones, they just slide in and don't necessarily stop you from moving axially, but they locate the uh, element for torque transfer. And they fail if they shear or if they roll. So if, if you round them over and they roll, maybe your key is too small for the slot and the slot got worn out or the key got worn out um, and they roll over and basically become pins and they might fall out, they might work their way out uh, or they just don't do what you intended for them to do. Um, so they, they will fail by shearing right along here. And so that's just a regular old shear calculation or they'll crush. You know, one of these surfaces here might crush uh, instead of shear. And so you exceed the yield strength and this crushes and that's where this corner might get rolled off um, or something changes with the surface where it's a little bit loose in there and they'll work, you know, over time they'll work their way out of there um, or they'll roll or they'll shear. You know, there's a couple of different ways they might fail. Um, since this failure is pretty straightforward, it's just shear on a little rectangular shape. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to do a calculation on a Woodruff key. So it would be the same type of calculation that you would do on here. But the Woodruff geometry is a, you, I just wanted to show you how to do it for a Woodruff because it's not as clear. And there's one confusing thing in their chart. So um, these are typical key sizes for certain size shafts. Um, here's the dimensions of the Woodruff key. Um, and you can also see here's kind of their diagram of a Woodruff. Um, showing that it's usually a lot more uh, near a half circle. So it does d dig down into that shaft a lot more. Um, so the, the confusing thing, or it can be confusing, over here, these are all the dimensions for the Woodruff key. So the W is the width of the key. So, you know, how wide is it? D is the, the diameter of the circle that makes the cube. Um, or not the cube, the, uh, the key. So it's not this distance. It's, you know, if you drew the whole circle, it's the diameter of that circle. Um, the height B is uh, the height of the cube. Or, I keep on the cube for some reason. <laughs> the height of the uh, Woodruff key. Um, the key seat depth is how far does it go into the shaft and how far does it go into the hub. And then they have this one called offset. Um, they don't label offset anywhere, and the, which is fine. You can figure out what it is, and we'll, we'll show it in a minute. The problem is the word offset, because if you talk about a Woodruff key with an offset or, or any kind of sheer key pin type thing, like either one of these with an offset, it normally doesn't mean what they mean here. What it means is, and I should have printed one of these because it's, I'm going to try and draw it. Let's just draw an, an offset square one um, because that would probably be easier than drawing an offset uh, Woodruff key. So this would be an offset key. So it would be a key that looks like it's, and now I didn't give a lot of area right here. There would be more area. This would probably shear really easily. Um, but it would look like a key that's halfway in the process of shearing. Um, and you'd think, why in the world would you want to offset a key like that? Well, uh, there are reasons, particularly automotive reasons, where uh, your that slot locates this pulley, you know, in a certain orientation. Um, and it might be for like ignition timing purposes uh, that you want to advance that a little bit. You want that. You want to change that uh, the rel relationship of where this slot is to where maybe this tooth is. You might want to change it a little bit uh, to advance the ignition timing or, or something like that. And you can do that with an offset key. So this word offset here doesn't at all mean that. <laughs> so that's my, my only uh, 
not complaint, but just warning here that this offset isn't what you're going to be talking about if you talk about an offset key. Um, it's offset key has this weird shape. So let's, let's see what these numbers and all do line up with. Since they don't give you a picture, they kind of give you a picture over here that shows at least the diameter and the width, uh, but that's all it shows. So uh, let's draw us a Woodruff key over here. So we'll do this. All right, so the key is just this part, and there's the circle that made it. All right, so the first thing they give you is W. That's actually the width, which I didn't draw here, but the width would be how far into the page it is. So the width of the thing, that's relatively straightforward. And you have this radius. Um, they don't give you the radius, but they give you the diameter. You'll notice that a lot um, in this type of book um, and in real life where very seldom do you specify a shaft or a pulley or anything by its radius you know it just don't it doesn't make sense to to talk about the radius so a lot of times you're talking about the diameter um, if you go to you know measure a shaft you you get some a micrometer or some calipers or whatever and you measure the diameter you don't measure the radius so a lot of things equations and everything um, are going to deal with diameter instead of radius. So this diameter, though, would be the diameter not of this line, but of the circle. So I'm going to draw it this way to make it more clear that it's not... Do they use a capital or a lower? They use a capital D. So the D is the diameter of the circle that made the... that the Woodruff key is cut from. Height B is this guy. The, uh, let's do the key seat depth in, in the shaft and the hub. So again, we'll have to draw some new stuff. Since, since I printed the shafts in red, I'll draw a red line here. So let's say that the shaft is, you know, kind of right here. So the Woodruff key is, is embedded in the shaft so a certain amount. And that's what they call the shaft depth, and then you have the hub depth. So those two would be, uh, let's see, this one would be the shaft depth, and this one, uh, let's do it this way, would be the hub depth. How far is it in the hub? And this offset is this distance. So let's let's draw a diameter line, and that is the they called it E. That little distance right there. How far below the diameter line does this Woodruff key start? Um, and so they give you those dimensions here. So let's, and now it's all cluttery. Maybe that's why they don't show, show that picture. Uh, you, can, you can figure them out by the numbers here. If you start drawing them out, you know what some of these are uh, and you can figure out what offset must be. You don't really necessarily need offset. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, you kind of do. You could figure it out from the diameter, I guess. Um, so it's kind of a redundant uh, uh, dimension anyway. All right, let's see how we might calculate something with this. Let's see. All right, we've got our Woodruff key in somewhere like this. It works the same way, well, except you got to keep it in there, line everything up. Oh, you know what? I didn't realize it. I made this wider than that, so it's not going to work. <laughs> so, 
I would need a narrow one. I actually have a narrow one. Uh, the problem with this is I made that slot too wide. There we go. So uh, it works the same way. Again, it doesn't prevent any axial. It just prevents the torque. Now it's gonna be really rattly because it's too narrow compared to the slot it's in. But it's down in there. And uh, let's calculate a little bit of uh, the shear stress on this thing. The shear stress and the crushing stress. So there, we have to manage both of them. So let's just to say that our Woodruff key is a, uh, a quarter inch by one. So we have some data in our chart. So we're talking a quarter, there's a quarter by seven eighths, there's a quarter by one. So the height of it, uh, let's see. It's right off the page, there it is. Quarter by one, the height is 0.438. These are all in inches. It doesn't give you, oh, well, it says inch series. It's off to the side up there. Quarter by one, 0.438 for the height of the key. It has a 1 16th offset, so that's how far below the, the line uh, of the, the top of the Woodruff key from its diameter, that the, from the circle that it's made from. Um, 0.308 is, are you on the right one? Yep, 0.308 is how far it's embedded in the shaft and 0 0.131 is how far it's in the hub. All right, so using those numbers, we can begin to calculate the shear. The shear is really straightforward. It's just a shear calculation, no, nothing special about it, other than let's draw a bigger picture of our Woodruff key so that we can look at these better all right so uh, again it's embedded somewhat in the shaft so we'll just use that to show where the shaft is versus the woodruff key all right so let's label some of these things we have the uh, height well let's do the depths first so 0.308 is how far it's in the shaft. So from here, those are inches. And then it's in the hub, 0.131. So that one would be here. And then that offset, which we actually are gonna need here in a second. So. Let's say that uh, the actual diameter is up here. That offset was um, a sixteenth of an inch. Yeah. So 0 0.0625. Okay. Um, normally you would line up all these arrows. I just ran out of room. I, mean, I didn't plan ahead, I guess. All right, so here's the center of this thing. The circle that would have created the Woodruff key. <clears throat> and the shear is going to happen right on this line right here. So we need to calculate. We, we know the width of it. The width of it is a quarter because I called it a quarter inch by one inch. Uh, Woodruff key. So it's into the paper. It's a quarter inch thick. So I need to calculate basically the the into the page area of this shear plane. And I don't have, I mean, I could probably just like estimate it because it's really close, but I want to do it, you know, as close as I can. So what you do is let's get us another color. What other color do I have? Uh, a green we have this triangle, right? And we know this height because it's going to be 0 0.131 plus 0 0.0625. You know, the offset plus how far it's into the hub. So 0 0.0625, that's the 1 16th plus 0 0.131. So this height right here is 0 0.1935 inches 
This one is just the radius, right? From the center out to a point on the circle. That's the radius of the circle. Um, it was a one inch circle, so this is 0 0.5 inches. And now I have a situation where um, I can use trigonometry. I can just use Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem to uh, calculate that distance for this little green triangle right here. So this could be B, or not B squared, but B, sorry. Um, so A squared plus B squared equals C squared. A squared would be the 0 0.1935 inches squared plus B squared, I don't know, equals the radius 0 0.5 inches squared. Therefore, B equals, I don't know, let's see, um, 0.1935 squared, 0.5 squared minus that, and then take the square root of that, B is 0.46. And then the entire shear plane is a, one B here and another B over here. So the length of this shear plane, let's just call it L, equals two times B equals 0.922 inches. Oh, we're almost off the page. Uh, so it did come out less than one. Obviously the diameter of the whole thing was one, so it should come out less than that, which that gives us some hope that we're doing it right. Um, and then thickness into the page. So the area there is just this length times a quarter inch. Um, and the rest of the calculation would just be, um, let's just say that this is a um, material that has a yield strength of, um, well, let's look it up. Let's say it's 1018 cold drawn steel. So in our book, we can go to table A20 in the back. Let's see if we can get to A20. Here we go. There's a 1018 cold drone. So it has a tensile strength of 64 uh, KSI uh, in <coughs> a yield strength of 54. So we need the yield strength for, we don't want it to yield. So 1018 cold drawn, 54 KSI. So I uh, might need a new sheet of paper. So let's let's get our length here. All right, so yield strength, I just looked it up. It was, uh, we're, we're using a 1018 hole drawn metal, 54 KSI. All right, and so we can use just distortion energy to calculate our SSY. And so that would give us 54 times uh, 0 0.577, 31.158 uh, KSI. And um, then all we have to do is go in and calculate, does it, uh, you know, does it have that much stress in it or not? So um, maybe we have a factor of safety or, well, we, we can calculate the factor of safety. So the uh, force, oh, I didn't say how much we're trying to hold. Uh, let's say that this Woodruff key is trying to hold. Remember, we did a similar thing right here where we, we had, had this uh, 1,000 pounds that the, was being held between the set screw and the... Uh, the shaft, you, we would need to calculate this force. We, we also did a similar thing last time where we had the torque that was needed to be transferred, had the radius of the shaft, and we figured out the tangential force there. So we need to know that force because that's the force that's acting on this uh, Woodruff key trying to shear it in this case. Uh, so let's just say we've done all that and that force 
the tangential force, let's just say it's 4,000 pounds. So it's a big, this is a big Woodruff key, so 4,000 pounds. Um, so what we do at that point is uh, we want to do, and these equations, I, I don't think these equations are in your book, but it's uh, just a shear stress. So our uh, yield strength for shear, Oh, yeah, I did the, I did points to fight. Yeah, all right, I did that. Um, factor safety or design factor. We're actually going to solve for their design factor in this case, so we're treating it more like a factor of safety. Equals the force over the area that that force is acting on. So we just calculated the length here to be 0.922. Uh, well, let's do length times width, and we'll fill in the numbers. So force of 4,000 pounds length of 0 0.922 inches uh, the width of it was a quarter inch and we just decided that early on way back over here we said it was a quarter by one woodruff key uh, and then ss wise so the shield shear yielding was 31.158 ksi and then over n so we can solve for n let's see uh, if we take our 31.5, well, 31,158 times 0.922 times 0.25, uh, that'll bring that up there, in over there. So let's divide that by 4,000, and we get in of 1.795. So um, it's greater than 1, so we would be okay. We would basically have a factor of safety or a design factor 1.8. Um, you might want more than that, or that's good for what you're doing. Um, we would also need to check, do we end up crushing either side of this thing? Um, so this piece obviously has less area than the piece embedded in the woodruff, in the shaft. Um, so we would need to actually take this green face here. Now what I would do in this case is actually just turned into a rectangle to kind of ignore those little endpoints over there and do 0.92 times 0.131 for this area right here that's uh, being pressed against so it's kind of like a bearing stress uh, and do the exact same thing except use the yield strength and get force length times uh, in this case they didn't have that letter was that called, no, that was just called the um, uh, C, C depth in the hub, I think is all they called that. We'll go back to that page. It's over here. There's critical speeds. So the hub key seat depth, and we would grab that number, the 0 0.131 is what we had right there so 0 0.131 times that depth here or not depth but that length here to get this area of this rectangle and uh, run it through the same equation here except compare it to our yield strength instead of our shear strength all right so uh, that's how I would handle calculating the failure of a Woodruff key uh, you would do the same thing for a rectangular key or a square key uh, it's just you don't have to go through the the rigmarole of figuring out what this length is right here It's just the length of the key. So it's a lot simpler to do All right so that talks about uh, keys set screws um, Woodruff keys and um, We didn't do the pins the pins would work similar to how we did the shear in here except you would essentially shear them you know in two places because it would be you usually don't have rectangular pins. You would have a round pin. Um, not that you couldn't have a rectangular pin, just then you have to drill a rectangular hole through the shaft. So it normally it's round. Um, there's not any advantage to having a rectangular one. All right. So we've done all that. But the next part of your book, let's see if they have any other little pieces in here that we haven't talked about. Um, they talk about retaining rings. They don't calculate anything with retaining rings, but I did create a retaining ring. So here, 
um, we've got this groove that uh, we have cut into a shaft. So one way that you can create an artificial hub, so I've got one hub right here, or a shoulder right here, um, is to put a retaining ring. Now, here's my version of a retaining ring. And what they do is they're springy metal that you can, uh, these little holes here, there's usually a tool. I didn't go get my spreader. I don't, it's over somewhere over there. Um, but you put two little ends and you spread them out kind of like this. And I'm just going to force this one over. It's just plastic. So they'll go in there and they'll snap into that uh, groove. And now I'm axially located. Um, I've got this artificial hub here, shoulder back here, or not hub, but artificial shoulder here, shoulder here, and I can't move this actually. Now, it doesn't do anything to prevent or to do tr torque transfer. So you either are trying to create something where it is freewheeling, like this, or it's combined with something else like a set screw or a pin or a key uh, to actually do the torque transfer. But it does do an axial location thing. The downside to them um, is, is this. Let me get it back apart. Maybe I can without breaking it all. Maybe not. There we go. The downside is you had to cut this really thin groove with sharp corners down inside there. Um, so this creates like a, a stress concentration factor of like four or five. Um, your book does give some estimates on those. Let's see. Uh, where are they? Um, they have a little chart that shows some first round estimations for these stress. Here they are. First iteration. Retaining ring groove. Yeah. Uh, a factor of safety of five in bending. Five in axial stress, which we don't have to deal a lot with with these shafts. Um, and then the uh, torsional shear stress of three. Oh, there's a question. The force is still the 4,000. Yes, this uh, the force would still be the 4,000. I assume the question was about when we were doing the, uh, the crushing force. It would still be the 4,000. The area would change. So instead of doing a shear force over the shear area, you're doing the bearing force over the bearing area, but it's still the same 4,000 pounds. Um, let's see. The last part of chapter seven is the limits and fits section. I think that's what they call it. Limits and fits, seven, eight. Um, all right, so this is sort of a introduction to geometric dimensioning and tolerancing is in here um, and just the idea but it's you know it's a couple of pages like five four pages uh, so it's not going to give you all that you need to know but it gives you enough to get started with this stuff um, so it starts out with some definitions of uh, basic size deviation upper dv all these different things um, some of the uh, you know all all of these are good to know um, it can be really confusing. You have to read it a lot of times to figure out what they're talking about here. Um, basic size, let's start with that one. There's kind of three different sizes. They don't really talk about all three of them in here, I believe. Maybe they do. Maybe it's embedded. But basic size is when you drew the thing up on SolidWorks, what size did you draw it there? So the, on the plans or ever, anywhere, you pick some number to make this part you know you made that diameter one inch or 25 millimeters or whatever you made it that's the basic size the the theoretical size of the thing is the basic size um nominal size sometimes uh you you have a basic size that's some number kind of a very exact number but it's really close to something else so maybe maybe we made this 0.498 inches but we call it a half inch shaft. So the nominal size is kind of that thing you name it, um, it the, the, the common size that it's close to. Um, and then there's the actual size. So when somebody made the thing, so this is 3D printed, so when it got off the printer, I take my, my micrometer and measure it. 
the actual size might not be either one of those. It might not be the basic size that I designed it. It might not be the, the nominal size that I named it. Um, it's the actual size of the thing. It may not even be round. Uh, so there's, a, there's some tolerance in creating actual parts. And that's what Limits and Fits gets into. Probably the most valuable piece of this chapter is this table right here. Um, what this table is, and, the, and these make no sense until you've uh, read and, and gone through this a couple of times. These letters and these numbers don't mean anything to you. Um, hopefully they'll mean a little bit in a minute. But uh, what this is, these are word definitions of different types of fits. So, and what we're talking about here is in this chapter, obviously we're talking about uh, shafts and some kind of hub. So a gear hub or a pulley hub or just a hub. Uh, and so that's why there's two numbers here or letter number, letter number. Uh, in this case, the first one, the capital one, is, is re referring to the shaft, um, I believe. Or no, 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 this is the hub. These are all the hubs. Um, you can do this two ways. So uh, you can have a hub basis or a shaft basis. This is the uh, hub basis. So talking about the hole basis. So the hole inside the hub. Uh, and so this first set of numbers is referencing the, the tolerance, not the size, but the tolerance on the, the size of this hole. And the second set are talking about the tolerance on the size of the manufacturing when you actually make the thing of the shaft. So at least that you can get that far so far. This first set of letter number is talking about the hole in the hub. Second set is talking about the diameter of the shaft. And you know, the fit is how does this hub fit onto this shaft? Is it a loose fit? Is, do I have to press it on there? Do I have to force it on there, like heat up the hub and drop it on and let it cool down? You know, how does it fit onto the shaft? And so all of these are, there's the clearance fits. So loose running, free running, close running, sliding, locational clearance. All of those mean that I can just slide it on. So this is a loose fit. Transitional fits depending on how the part actually came out when you made it you might be able to slide it on or you might have to apply some amount of force to put it on there um, and it's dependent on how it actually got made uh, you know what were the tolerances that were held when it was actually on the lathe or cast or however these parts were made and then the interference fits there's uh, locational interference, medium drive, and the force fit. These, um, you have to actually apply some amount of force to put the parts together. Um, so these interference fits can actually be useful as a way to permanently locate, well not permanently, but positively locate your, your part on the shaft because you have to force it on there. So if you force it on maybe all the way against this shoulder, then it's going to stay there within reason. So assuming there's not a huge axial force trying to push it back off, then that interference fit, the fact that this hole is smaller than that diameter, means that it's going to stay put there. Um, and so those are your interference fits. Now, um, I made these parts right here so that we can kind of get an idea of what's going on. So here's a hub. And this is a little piece of a shaft. So just a tiny piece. Keys under there. And you could see this would be this. When I make this, there's some amount of tolerance. Now, again, I've over exaggerated everything. So these are going to be way more than what you would experience. The tolerances that are associated with these numbers are in the, you know, ten thousandths of an inch range or something like that. You know, it's, it's Maybe that's that's for the large tolerances too. So um, again, I've exaggerated everything, but there's some amount of there's some big uh, you know uh, we're going to allow this size is the maximum hole size, um, and then I made this little sleeve where that's the minimum hole size, and somewhere in that range is how it actually got made. 
So we, we, we specify how much we're willing to uh, uh, give up on the tolerance through these tolerance letters. Um, actually, the numbers. The numbers are the tolerance. Uh, the letters are the fundamental deviations. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, so there's some tolerance on when I go to make this part, um, I send it off to the shop and I tell them, you know, you got to make it where the hole is anywhere from that size to that size. And so this, this thickness of this represents the tolerance I'm willing to take. Uh, same thing with the shaft. The shaft could be that size or it might be uh, that size. So it might be bigger. And again, there's some tolerance zone that I'm okay with. Um, so you could end up, when you allow these tolerances, you could end up with a situation like this where there's a whole lot of slop in there. Again, way exaggerated, but anywhere from very loose fit to, let's say that they're both, the hole is as small as it can be and the shaft is as large as it can be, and now I've got a, a really tight fit. Um, that's what these definitions let you do without having to go in there and specify every time you make a shaft and a hub or a hole that the shaft goes into, you don't have to go figure out what this thickness is. What you do instead is, at least when you're using this system, is you specify these uh, ranges. So if I want a sliding fit, which is more or less what I have here. So a sliding fit, they're, they're not intended to run freely but must move and turn freely and locate accurately. Actually, I probably have more like a, a loose fit on these 3D printed parts, but um, because it's just, uh, there, there's no, you know, there's nothing, no, it, it's totally loose. Um, and these letters and numbers tell us four pieces of information. So again, the first, let's zoom in so we can see a little closer. The uh, sliding fit, the, the, the letter here the capital letter in our case, we're on a hub basis. So we're talking about the hub. The H does not stand for hub. The H stands for the fundamental deviation. So how, how much are we intentionally going to um, move this basic size? Remember the basic size is the design size. So how much am I intentionally gonna over or under size that basic size? Uh, to create the kind of fit that I want. H means I'm not going to over or undersize it at all. So you can go back in the back of the book. I'm not sure why they didn't put these tables somewhere near here, but um, they are in uh, A11 is where they're at, is where they start. So we'll have to zoom out to see all this. A11 uh, these are the tolerance grades. So these are the numbers. We haven't talked about the number yet. Um, and then here are the fundamental deviations on A12, actually. And now it's a lowercase h here. Um, it's still h, though. So uppercase and lowercase are to distinguish between, am I talking about the hub or the, or the hole or the shaft? Um, and so this, the same letter, it doesn't matter that it's upper or lowercase. The upper and lowercase just tells me if I'm talking about the shaft or the hole. Uh, and H has a bunch of zeros here. So H means that I am going to try and hit the basic size, uh, whatever I specified it as. Sometimes I want to intentionally go under or over the basic size because I want a certain type of fit to be guaranteed, no matter how much tolerance I allow. Uh, and so I want, that, I want that hole to always be a little bit smaller if I'm trying to do an interference fit because I want to have that interference happen. And so I might... Uh, might undersize the uh, hole. Now in the, again, like I said, there are there's the hole basis and the uh, shaft basis. In the hole basis, you'll notice that these are all H's, meaning that I'm, I'm not changing the hole, I'm changing the shaft to create the fit. The number that goes with each of these is the tolerance I'm gonna allow. So it's basically, you know, how thick is this tolerance zone that I'm going to allow. And so I, I did sliding fit. So that's an H7. So I'm not changing the basic size intentionally of the hole that I'm going for, but I'm going to allow for a seven 
on the tolerance. So let's go back to A11 in this case and see what that is. And here's where these things become. I didn't point this out on the last time, um, so I'll point it out now. This is how these are useful, is that there's the seven. IT7 means international tolerance, seven. Um, these are all in metric. These two are metric. They converted these two tables into US on the next two pages. Um, this basic size, I've got anywhere from a zero millimeter diameter shaft or hole up to a 400 millimeter uh, diameter shaft or hole. And the tolerance is scaled to the different sizes of holes and shafts. So this ring scales depending on if I'm talking about a 10 millimeter shaft or a 180 millimeter shaft. Also, you'll notice, let's zoom in on this one, if I can get over there to it. You'll notice that like this goes zero to three, this is three to six. Um, so where does the three go? The three goes in the upper one and you, it says it over here, um, size ranges are for over the lower limit, so greater than zero, and including the upper limit, so including three. So they, they describe where you put the ones that land right on like 18 or 18. Does it go in the 10 to 18 or the 18 to 30? Well, it goes in the 10 to 18. So read the little description over here to know if you're on one of these breaking points, which, which side to go to. Um, so if we had a, let's see, this, this hole looks like it's uh, 30 millimeters or so. So I would go to the 18 to 30. It's an IT7 or h7 so it was i'm aiming for 30 but i'm okay if it's uh 0.021 off of that these are millimeters by the way so that's not much at all so even though I'd, I'd made these really thick and big that was just to prove a point uh these are tolerances are actually really tight um and so that 021 this ends up being a unilateral so um Unilater I don't know if your book talks too much about unilateral and bilateral tolerances. I don't think they do. The idea there is, um, let's draw a picture. What time? Oh, we got time. All right. So if this is my target line, a, you know, that's, that's the surface of whatever I'm trying to make. A bilateral tolerance would say that I might end up on either side of that and be okay. A unilateral, so this would be bilateral. So this is when you see a number plus or minus some percent or plus or minus some number, that's this thing. Here, a unilateral is all of that tolerance is on one side. So I'm not gonna be any smaller than this, but I might end up that large. So for these, for these to work, they end up being unilateral tolerances. Lost my page. It's over here. Um, they do give you a diagram here that you can try to work your way through a couple of times. Um, there really is a lot in these dimensioning and tolerancing uh, procedures. Uh, we have a whole elective course. Of course, if you're not taking it right now, you might not can take it. It's only in the spring. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a whole thing by itself. So your book gives you a, in, enough so that when you see these letters and numbers, you kind of have an idea of what you're doing with them. Um, what you can do with them now is figure out the type of fit that you want. Do you want a force fit? Do you want a loose fit of some sort? Uh, then this gives you the nomenclature for defining that kind of fit. So what you do is you, you create the basic size. I want a half inch shaft with a sliding fit. So you do a half inch uh, and then you do a H7 G6. And the hole would be specified as a half inch hole. The shaft would be specified as a half inch shaft, but the tolerances on it would be H7 G6. And that shows where uh, the machinist, whoever's making the hole and the shaft, where they can allow for some tolerance. Um, you might wonder, well, why not just make these tolerances all super tight and exact? 
Um, and sometimes you have to do that, but the more exact you need, the more specialized equipment that you have to do or the more processes you have to grind this down you have to polish it down uh, and so it's more expensive more time consuming so um, you really want to use the appropriate tolerance and fit not necessarily the most accurate um, sometimes you need the most accurate one but it's going to cost most of the time um, you might think the other side well why not just make them all loose um, and that can cost you in other ways. Yes, it's cheaper to make the loose ones, but now your machine is sloppy and it might be less efficient. And so the product may not be as good. So um, you have to you have to be uh, thoughtful of what type of fit do you actually want to create? And uh, are you willing to pay for that type of fit? Or is this one where the tolerances are, uh, can be a little bit looser? Or do they need to be a little bit looser because it's supposed to be an... Uh, a pulley that uh, runs on an axle and so you need a loose fit um, or do you are you counting on that uh, interference fit to hold the pulley in place and so it has to be an interference fit so this is a way without knowing anything about the actual diameter you can specify what type of fit you want and then the, the person making the parts can go and figure out what their tolerances actually are um, so it's good for that. They do sh give you a couple of calculations here. Um, I don't have time to run through them. Um, they're, they're really straightforward, though, except for one thing that's just not mentioned. But um, these calculations are for the interference fit. So when you do want a part to uh, be force fit some level onto another part, so I want to... <laughs> I want to actually have to apply pressure of some sort or apply force and it creates a pressure inside the gap between these two um, to force this gear onto the shaft so that it stays put or maybe you're forcing a pin into a hole so it stays put. Um, these calculations will first let you calculate the pressure between so the pressure on this surface after I've applied the thing obviously there's some level where you make the hole too small and the shaft too large and there's too much pressure built up and you you crack the hub or you crush the surface of the shaft um, so there's there is a limit on how much this interference can actually be uh, this is the pressure that you uh, create when you have different size diameter holes and shafts now these do allow for a hollow shaft um, it's because they have a DI in here. Uh, the DI is the inner diameter of the shaft. We haven't really done anything with hollow shafts, but it does allow for maybe you have a hollow shaft. Um, then it goes through. So that, that's how you calculate that interface pressure. And then based on that interface pressure, you can calculate the stress in the on the hub or on the shaft. And there's two different ones of them here. There's a... Um, tangential stress and a radial stress so you end up with two orthogonal stresses and it just says i don't have to zoom out it just says tangential and radial stresses are orthogonal and should be combined using a failure theory to compare compare with the yield strength and it just doesn't tell you where to do that so what you do is you go to, uh, back to page 237 uh, equation 5 113 and that's uh von mises comparing or combining uh, these two stresses. So that equation is actually back in your book. I don't know why they didn't reference it here. Um, I guess you don't have to use, you could use uh, a different way to combine them, but uh, probably the one that you're gonna use is the uh, equation 5113. So this equation right here. Oh wait, maybe that's 257? No, there it is, right there. So plane stresses being combined together. Um, and that way you can compare that stress to the yield strength of the hub material and the shaft material to make sure you didn't yield either one of them. Because you wouldn't want to yield them. That would be bad. I mean, you certainly wouldn't want to fracture them. Um, the last bit over here is uh, knowing that pressure also you can calculate the force and therefore the torque that this 
press fit interference fit can handle. So this is the same kind of torque that we did like this. So it will give you that force. This force would be the frictional force, only it's all the way around, right? So you'll see like a pi LD that is that pi LD in this equation, that's basically the surface of the uh, surface area of the cylinder of the shaft that's in contact with the hub. And then you've just got F, so that's the frictional coefficient between the two. And then there's P, that pressure that was generated by them being different sizes, but yet being forced together. And then the torque is the same thing. It's kind of hard to see in there, but there's the pi LD. Um, it's d squared this time, but pi LD again is the surface area of the shaft or the hub. And uh, D over two would be the radius. So that's where you've got the force times the radius to get that torque that it can handle. So I don't know why, I would have written these a little bit differently. Basically, this torque is this force times D over two is all that is. They just combine the D um, to have D squared. So uh, I would have written them slightly different just to make them clearer what they mean. All right. Um, I think we are about out of time. Next time on Wednesday, we are going to do, what are we doing? Power screws. So we're moving on from shafts and moving into threaded fasteners. But we're for, before we do threaded fasteners like bolts, we're going to do power screws. So um, they kind of fit with bolts because they're threaded, um, but they don't really fasten things. They move things. So we'll do that on Wednesday uh, and then move on to bolts. We're getting halfway through the content for test one sort of um, we're about halfway through test one's content um, all right let me know if you have any questions about that stuff um, I'm gonna uh, end here I don't think we have any more plus we're out of time so uh, I'll see you guys on Wednesday